Namjoon Pike. I love Namjoon Pike. I tried to keep this short because I'll go on about him forever. Um, but I haven't seen this work, so here's the thing. Um, I'm going to see it this weekend. So I'm working on like a little bibliography for you guys, and then I had a few follow-up notes, like the music on the Sharon Nishad. I found some stuff out about it. So I will, there is inf you're going to get more information from me about this one. Because um, I don't know what's in Utah, basically. That's, <laughs> I'm going to find out what's in Utah. So here we have this work. It's obviously a map of the United States. What's it made of? Neon, the, the sort of borders. Yeah, and then behind all of these television monitors and the signals received by these television monitors are sort of determined by what state they are vaguely in. Uh, and some of them have, it's, it's, in some cases it's really obvious, in others less so. We will watch a short clip. It's, um, it's a Smithsonian. Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm super excited. Also, what we don't, we do not see Alaska or Hawaii here. They're on another part of the wall. I think in the video clip we see them for a second. Here we just see the continental US. So he made this work in 1995, but as an artist, his career began. He's born in Korea. He moved to Germany in the late 50s, early 60s, where he studied music. He was a composer, and then he moved to the US. And he was involved with Fluxus. Are you guys familiar with Fluxus? Do you know what that is? So um, if, if I say conceptual art, are you like, yeah, yeah, I know what that is? You know, instructions, pour a gallon of paint out on the floor, let it dry, Lawrence Wiener. Um, Fluxus predates conceptual art and really pioneered many of the strategies used by conceptual artists. So it was international. Fluxus had members in Japan, in Korea. Yoko Ono is a famous Fluxus member that you guys might be familiar with. George MacUnis, um, Eastern European. I forget where he was from exactly. He spent most of his career in the US. He was sort of their leader. So Japan, Korea, numerous nations in Europe, uh, the UK, the US, Canada, Latin America. Like this was a really international movement, Fluxus. And one of the things that allowed it to be international was that they didn't make big heavy things. They made mail art and instructions and sound recordings and um, telegrams. They sent telegrams. So they really pioneered this idea of reducing the artwork to an idea that could be transmitted in a variety of ways. So Pike is involved with Fluxus. He, he meets up with them in Germany, and then he becomes much more involved when he moves to the US. And he is a pioneer in video art. He begins working with television sets. So this is really important. We're going to look at Pike, and then we're going to look at Bill Viola. And both of them are, are sort of seen as like really important figures in video art. Uh, and they're very different in ways that I think it's important to break down. So Pike is invested in televisions. In 1963, there is no video art. There are no video cameras except in television stations. There are no portable video cameras. So in 1963, there are television sets, but nobody's recording video. Uh, people can make film. Do we, are we clear on the differences between film and video? Or do, are those two terms conflated in your minds? Do they mean the same thing? Okay, so film is photographic. Film is um, a light, sensitive material in little squares in a strip. You expose it to light, and then you run it through a projector, right? It's mechanical. Um, so you expose that strip of film to light, and then you have to develop it, and then you go and you edit it, you cut it up, and you put the pieces together. Video is an electronic signal. It's picked up by a camera. It is transmitted instantaneously. So it can be transmitted instantaneously to a recording medium, like tape, or to a monitor, or out onto the airwaves to your television at home. This is not anymore, but until quite recently with broadcast. So video is electrons, right? It's not a physical, mechanical medium in the way that film is. You can pick up a strip of film. You cannot pick up a strip of video. You can pick up a strip of videotape, but you can't see anything. It's just black. There's electrons on it. We can't read it. So 
Pike was really interested in this quality of video's instantaneousness, the fact that it can be broadcast. You don't have to carry it from one place to another. It just goes out like radio, essentially, on the airwaves. And it's electronic, and he sees the future in video. Um, but here, of course, he can't record it yet. So he's engaging with the television set in these earliest pieces. So here, Zen for TV, he is, has anybody, does anybody remember back in the days of crummy old television when your TV dies and you can still hear things, but all you get is this line or a dot of light in the center? He did that on purpose to this television set. He would mess with them wearing rubber boots so he wouldn't get electrocuted uh, until, all this would do was just show a single line, and he sets it up, and it's zen for TV. It's this meditative object. You just sit and look at it. So television in the 1960s is one of the most powerful mediums of the time, if not the most powerful. And he wants people to be able to speak back to this medium. So one way is to mess with the machine, to change it so that the picture it shows is different, as he did. Um, was then for TV, but here the same year he developed participation TV. These images are from later presentations of the work, except I think for this one. So there's a television set and it's attached to a microphone. Now the sounds that go through a microphone are electronic signals, the same way that light that goes through a camera is an electronic signal. So he basically, he sets up the television so that instead of picking up the broadcast signal from space, well, not space space, but you know what I mean, uh, it instead is picking up and responding to the sounds coming through the microphone. So you get these abstract patterns when you speak into the microphone. So with this, uh, it's a pretty clumsy little object to our eyes, but his thinking was that people will be able in the future, and he thought about the future a lot, in the future, people will be able to play their TV the way you'd play a musical instrument. You'll jam on it like you would a guitar. Um, there was a lot of drug taking going on, just as a heads up. So this idea that one would want to sit around for hours, like boop, 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 making like little um, abstract patterns on the TV made a, a, a little more sense than it might today. Magnet TV, this is a favorite. So basically, in the olden days, if you put a magnet on your TV, the picture would, right? The, the magnet would suck up the electrons. I don't, I, I'm really bad with physics. I don't really know how it works. Um, but it would warp the image. So he would have just standard um, signal coming in. There's a, a famous still where it's uh, Richard Nixon on TV. But the magnet, this heavy magnet is on top, and so his face is all swirly and deformed. One of his most famous works, partly because his collaborator Charlotte Moorman was arrested for indecency. So Moorman was a classical cellist uh, who got involved with the avant-garde in New York and with um, Namjoon Pike. And so this piece, uh, TV Bra for Living Sculpture, she plays uh, her cello while, hold it, while she's got these little mini television sets uh, as a bra. That's the one that got her arrested. This one I think is a little more exciting where the cello is this stack of television sets. And the, the strings of the cello are basically when she plays, they change the signal in the television sets. So she's creating sound, but she's also changing the images as she goes. And then I think my all-time favorite, Pike work. Uh, so we did it first in 1974. This is a 2000 installation at the Guggenheim. It's a garden. <laughs> um, it's plants. It's a bunch of real plants. They're potted, of course. It's the Guggenheim. And interspersed amongst them are these television sets. And they're all playing a video that he made uh, in the 70s called Global Groove. So. I, this is all any of those works would work, but I'm gonna, I want to use this one in order to clarify something about Pike's practice that's important to distinguish from video artists like, say, Mariko Mori, who we looked at last time, or Bill Viola. Pike uses TV sets, right? He's interested in this sort of item of technology and furniture that everybody had in their homes that were familiar, ordinary, commonplace. 
Whereas Maury and Viola, and I will get into this difference more when we get to, to Viola, are artists who use projection often against a wall or a screen so that their video takes on the quality of a mural or a film. Um, they become monumental and grand. Whereas Pike's works consistently are just like, it's a TV set. Yes. So in this work, the technology was there for him to create his own video, but in those earlier works, was it just whatever was on TV? Was yes. Right? Thank you. That's a really important clarification. He started, so in 1975, sorry, 1965, important, 65. Uh, Pike and Andy Warhol were both loaned portable video recorders. They couldn't be purchased yet, couldn't buy them, but you could, they were, because they were artists who were doing work that was interesting to these companies, they were loaned these video cameras. Nothing that Pike made at that time in 65 survives. Um, Warhol's Inner and Outer Space is a film in which we see um, video being played back on a television monitor. So we see him using it in that case. In 1967, the Sony Portapack is released. So two years later, and that's when video art picks up and gets going. So in 67, Pike starts regularly recording video himself using video cameras, but also working in television stations um, that had artist residencies. I, I could, I, I'll try not to get into that too much. It's my, that's my research. I'm excited about it. Uh, so he's using television technology, he's using video cameras, and he builds with his friend Shuya Abe, who's an engineer, they build a video editing and processing suite to sort of mess with the signal, to break it, essentially. So in 63, he breaks the television set to, to give it just this line, and then in 67, 68, 69, and through the early 70s, he's looking for ways to break the video signal so that it doesn't just look like ordinary TV. It's, you see its sort of failures, its glitches. He plays them up, um, overly hot color. So the video in this um, global groove is a combination of material from television, Japanese um, commercials from TV, uh, and then also footage that he's recorded. Um, do you guys know what color keying is or chroma keying? You know when you see the, the person, um, the, the weather person in front of the screen and they're like blah, 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 and you know that there's nothing behind them except a blue or green screen and they're looking at another. It's that technology that allows the, the people in the processing booth to replace blue with another video signal. He's doing a lot of work with that. So Global Grooves in, involves a lot of that, and a lot of people dancing. So there's like this jazzy dance music playing in the garden. OK, back to, oh. Did you see in the garden? Yes, I did. I gave this uh, retrospective, I was in New York. I think I was at Cooper Union when this was up. So I actually got to go to a talk that he was at. He didn't say anything, though. He was in a wheelchair at that point, but got to be like, in the presence of the master. <laughs> um, yeah. It really was. Um, and his is work that it'll be interesting to see how it is maintained because it relies so much on what is a, a technology that's no longer in use, these old, crusty old television sets. Uh, so, I mean, will museums that own his work maintain? old style television monitors in order to play his work. We'll see. I mean, they kind of have to. They have no choice. So this work, let's actually watch a little a clip of it so that you have a better sense of its, you know, what it's like. So do you know what state that is, that it just, yeah. So there were um, politicians. So they're thematically organized. I don't know. I'm going to find out this weekend, and I will let you know. It looks like it might just be salt flats. 
Um, salt flats is just kind of empty and yeah. Kansas is the Wizard of Oz. Yes, yeah, so it's all looping, but, yeah, that's enough sound. Um, these are videos he's compiled, they're looping, uh, but there is one live feed, and I don't know which state that is. I won't know until I go and see it. Does it change, or it's always the same number? That's a good question. I don't, all I know is that in the description of the work, it's like uh, 52 um, uh, channel, installation with one live feed. So our information mm -hmm. is really incorrect. This is 49 channels. At the end of you have OD. It's really 52. You've got Alaska and Hawaii. Yeah. Yes. Although, again, I'm going to double check it when I'm there. Um, well, maybe because the, the last one is a live feed. I don't know. Hmm. Like. Okay, you know what, what I have here, sorry, this is what, with numbers, I just, I'm like, I guess it's 51 channels plus a live feed is what I have from the Smithsonian. Um, right? It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so I, w but I, I'm going to find out which is the live feed, where I'm sure, and the live feed means probably that you can see yourself, right? Oh, it's probably DC, because you're in DC when you see. I'll let you know. Um, so what kinds of connections, focusing on this work in the context of his larger practice, what kinds of connections can we establish between the media that he is using, television and neon, and what he's representing, which is a map of the United States? What if we, I mean, does the title help, thinking about that title? What is the electronic superhighway? Well, that's the internet in 1995. That's when the internet came out. And he, he did not literally invent the internet, but he anticipated the internet. Um, some aspects of his anticipation are hilariously silly. Um, in fact, I think I talked about one of them last time, this idea that um, instant video phone communications and virtual sex will cause people in different countries to fall in love with one another's spouses and so they'll stop bombing each other. That, that was him. Um, but also he's like, in the future, because everybody will make their own TV, the TV guide will be as big as the phone book. So one half of that is right on. People are going to make their own TV. The other half is not so much, <laughs> right? The idea that it would be, um, programmed in the same way that it is now. But he did anticipate a world in which information flowed freely. Um, so the, uh, the American, the contemporary highway system, the freeway system that we have now, was established just before he got here. So he's one of the sort of, when he arrived in America, it was suddenly possible to just drive anywhere with relative ease, the sense everything is accessible. Uh, but do you think that this is a work that suggests get out on the road and drive around America? Why not? Yeah, everything will come to you. Right? Um, because this is what the electronic superhighway allows. It means that information no longer has a place. It's everywhere. Now, are you guys familiar with Marshall McLuhan? Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Marshall McLuhan um, because he's really important when we think about um, media and medium in contemporary art and especially for Pike. I'm going to go back to, I have a quote here, I think. Yes. So I'm going to read you the quote and then I'll sort of break it down a little bit for you. So McLuhan was an English professor who in 1964 wrote a book called um, uh, Understanding Media, the Extensions of Man. And it was a breakout. He was um, like the public intellectual of his day. He was on the cover of all the magazines. He was on TV all the time. Uh, he was in a Woody Allen movie. 
as himself. He had a cameo in a Woody Allen movie. He wrote, language as the technology of human extension, whose powers of division and separation we know so well, may have been the so-called Tower of Babel, by which men sought to scale the highest heavens. Today, computers hold out the promise of a means of instantaneous translation of any code or language into any other code or language. The computer, in short, promises by technology a Pentecostal condition of universal understanding and unity. The next logical step would seem to be not to translate, but to bypass languages in favor of a general cosmic consciousness. That face, I'm getting a real like, mm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and it may be familiar from our discussion of Marika Mori, right? So McLuhan basically argued that electronic media, so pre-mechanical mediums allowed us to extend the mechanics of our bodies. A shovel allows us to extend the digging capability of our hands. A car or a bicycle allows us to extend the moving capability of our legs. But, or uh, binoculars allow us to extend the, the seeing capacity of our eyes. So these are examples. But he says with electronic media, what is extended is our minds. Right? So he argued, he, he's, he, have you guys heard the phrase, the medium is the message? That's Marshall McLuhan. So what he argued is that the meaning in television is not what's on. It's the experience that we have with the technology. This increasing sense, we don't need to go anywhere, it will come to us. Uh, a way of reading the world in little bits and snippets, right, in commercial breaks. Uh, so he's like, it's not the content that matters, it's the way it's delivered that changes how we think and understand and see the world. And so Pike is one of a generation of artists who really emerged in a world very much shaped by McLuhan's thinking. He was very invested in it. And this idea that electronic technology will allow us to bypass cultural and language differences, as well as geographical differences. We will have like this ultimate mind melt through the internet. Uh, so far that hasn't quite happened. Um, but wow, it's a lot easier to communicate with people in other parts of the world to translate things in other languages that we don't know. So aspects of what he anticipated and what McLuhan anticipated have really come to pass. I mean, in general, the things that were exciting and effective about his practice didn't change that much. Um, he adopted a few new technologies, but his interest was consistently in working with, a fam with familiar medium. So whether that's television or neon, um, which you know, we see all over the place, a little less now than we used to, but certainly then it was everywhere. Uh, these are ordinary common technologies, and the changes that he makes to them, the ways in which he manipulates them, are fairly uh, rudimentary, right? Um, the, the, the machine that he and Shuya Abe built, the um, Pike Abe video synthesizer, uh, was, magical and disastrous, right? Like it was just cobbled together out of all kinds of stuff. There was very limited actual control. They were like, oh, if we press this button and pull this lever, things turn red. I mean, they, they, um, they didn't have precise control of the kind that we're accustomed to. And he never showed any interest in having that kind of precise control. He wanted to make the medium accessible and transparent. He didn't want us to see through video or television. He wanted us to see video and television, right, as media. And this is important in comparison to some of the other artists we're looking at in that they try to make the medium disappear, 